This is an Apple computer, but unlike the ones that you've used before, it's not pretty because it's intended to be hidden away in a server rack. I know, right? Like what? I mean, when you think of Apple, you think of consumer electronics because that's the only thing that they advertise. But they not only made servers, but they quietly did so for over 20 years. And by the time they reached their final form, these things could be found in businesses and schools throughout the world, being used for everything from file serving to media workflow acceleration to Microsoft Active Directory services. Wait, an Apple server for a Microsoft? Anyway, the point is they were unlike other Apple products in many ways. For one, the XServe lineup was positioned as a budget alternative to premium solutions from PC makers. It's upside down world. It raises so many questions. Like, why was it so cheap? Did it have any redeeming qualities? Why did Apple ultimately pull the plug? To find out, we bought the last XServe machine that Apple ever produced, and we're gonna take it out for a rip. This is gonna be fun, bud. Fun, like this segue to our sponsor. Set app. Owning this doesn't turn you into a professional by design. It's more about great software and how you use it. If you're someone who creates value with the help of your Apple devices, you should check out all the superpowers that the apps from Setapp can give you. Link down below. We considered the 2009 XServe 3.1 to be the last real server from Apple because while there were server versions of the Mac Mini until 2012, they were basically the same as their desktop counterparts, just with some minor tweaks to the specs. With third-party accessories, they could be used to fill the Apple-shaped void in an organization's rack, but it was pretty clear that Apple's focus had moved on, and over the next 10 years, they would slowly chip away at the functionality of their macOS server software until its eventual death in 2022. But enough about that. We've got a Mac server in its prime, and this is my first hands-on. What exactly did they think different? Well, for a server, she's definitely pretty slick and stylish and weighs only a mere, uh, <laughs> 40 pounds with uh, most of the drive bays not populated. The system identifier button is on both the front and the back. When you press it, it flashes both of them, which is a nice little quality of life feature that makes it easy to locate on the rack. On the other side of our front USB is our ethernet port lights. Then right of that are the system activity lights. If you hold down the power button and the identifier button to boot, that allows you to use the lights to select a boot method without requiring a monitor or any input devices. Now, given its utility as a file server and a media server, you'd think it would have a lot more drive bays. It has only three by default. Ah, an XServe server would normally be paired with an XRAID, which, as you probably guessed, is a rack-mounted RAID enclosure that would sit either right above it or right below it, giving it an additional 14 drive bays. Now, obviously, we're not gonna deploy this thing, so we don't need one of those, but we do need at least one, and we were missing all of them out of the box, so we had to order one off of eBay. As it turns out, the sleds are proprietary, which isn't uncommon, but the connectors are also proprietary, which is uncommon we received what may have been one of the last remaining sealed XServe drives in existence. Fun fact, by the way, for both the XServe and the XRAID, the drives themselves are just standard SATA and SAS hard drives. And then beyond adapting them to this proprietary interface, Apple also went a step further and vendor locked them through the firmware. So even if you could get your hands on random extra sleds, you couldn't simply upgrade them with off-the-shelf replacements. Bastards. They weren't the only ones who pulled this kind of crap, but that doesn't make it okay. I can't wait to take this apart. This thing is just kind of wild to me, right? Like some stuff may not be normal today, but was at the time, like having a slim optical drive in the front of your server. But other things were weird even then, like the fact that it has FireWire ports and mini display port instead of just basic VGA. How does Apple always manage to make hardware look so pretty. And what are you? You look like a weird little drive of some sort. Yo, Tanner, 
Yes. What the devil is this little guy here? That little guy is the primary hard drive for it. So even it is when, a drive. Yeah, even when all three of these are empty, your operating system's still gonna go on there. And it uses a proprietary connector because just, it can? I'm assuming I'm gonna find the fans under the cool little shroud. Yes, uh, there they are. They may be short, but boy, are they ever thick. What is this card? This thing is chock full of what appears to be both NAND flash and DRAM? Tanner, when you told me this thing is basically just a 2009 Mac Pro, but in server form, I didn't think I was gonna be finding whatever this is. Would that possibly be a RAID card? Oh, yes, that is very possible. Confirmed this is a RAID card, and you could apparently buy this RAID card as a PCIe card as well. That is hilarious. And if I had to guess, I would say this plug right here is the same one that this one is using for its backup battery because I don't see a backup battery in here. And under normal circumstances, you would want to have a battery on a hardware RAID card because that way any data that was in flight, like sitting in the cache on the RAID card about to be written to the hard drives in the event of a sudden power loss could be preserved by keeping the card powered so that it could be flushed to the drives after the fact. Or it's possible that Apple assumed that if this thing is sitting in a data center somewhere, oh, oh no, that there should be no reason for it to suddenly lose power. I need to find all those screws. Fortunately, <laughs> I've got the LTT store screwdriver complete with magnet screw finding bit. Hopefully these are ferrous screws. Ah, yes, they are. Oh, good. One, two. Got another dual gigabit network card here. I'm assuming this is just gigabit, right? Yes. Yeah, all right, nothing special about that. But what I'm really interested in is this card under it. You know what this looks like? An MXM module. Is that what it is? Is this a GPU? Yup. Why the hell are they putting laptop GPUs in servers? Huh. Oh, and it's Nvidia. This is before they started quarreling and uh, didn't use any of each other's products anymore for anything. What is this? I believe that is a GT130. I love when Apple builds in upgradability into their products and then completely abandons them, like the 2019 Mac Pro. You know, this reminds me of the 2019 Mac Pro in more ways than one. You've got the unrealized upgrade potential, and then you've also got the fact that it's a rack-mounted server version of what is essentially the same hardware running the same software, Mac OS. It's just that when the 2019 version rolled around and we thought, ooh, maybe they'll you know, pay attention to the server space again, clearly that didn't happen. And, oh wait, yeah, I guess that's not really a difference because that also happened here. They were also both based on Intel platforms with RISC-based CPUs that would precede and follow them. One difference is that I wouldn't describe the XServe lineup as a failure. So where did these things come from? Well, it was ultimately Apple's strong foothold in the education and media sectors that really kept these things alive. So naturally, those are two areas that remained strong targets when their enterprise equipment first started rolling out with the new OS X, created as a rebrand with the return of Steve Jobs and the later release of the iPod. So to continue to fit into these markets, they allowed easy integration into existing Windows-heavy environments, easy creation and maintenance of workflows for things like network installation of newly purchased Macs, and a video podcast creation system that required minimal human intervention that ran best on XServe. This last point is also important because it allowed Apple to help saturate the podcast section of iTunes with videos that were made to be viewed on things like the existing iPod video and then later the iPhone. Educators could put lectures online, media companies could expand to new mediums, and enthusiasts were rewarded for their purchase with some of that delicious, sweet content. Mmm, content. Oh yeah, right, we're supposed to be making content about this. Uh, let's turn it on. Wow, those are just about the brightest network activity indicator LEDs I have ever seen. I'm here for it, I appreciate that. Hey, look at that. Uh, what's my name? 
LTT. Daddy, oh, sorry, what? We're booted up into Snow Leopard, but the way we got here was very complicated. With no drive for it, the system initially booted into recovery for Yosemite, but recovery would get stuck because it required an Apple ID. Well, Apple IDs these days require two-factor authentication, which is something that was missing from the sign-in process on our Yosemite recovery drive. The workaround is to put the 2FA number at the end of the password, but then it refused to authenticate because the TLS and SSL encryption that were baked into the operating system were using expired keys and there was no way to update them. The newest macOS version that supports the XSurf is El Capitan. So you might say, just install that, right? Wrong. When you try to create a bootable USB installer on something more modern, like a 2017 MacBook Pro, it'll tell you that El Capitan will not run on the machine and refuse to create the device. Apple, if you need a working operating system on a machine in order to install an operating system on that same machine, users with faulty drives on older systems are forced to take their devices to the Genius Bar. I am not rolling up to the Guildford Apple store with this thing. They hate me enough already. So we settled on Snow Leopard server. It installed fine, though it still refused to run the installer for El Capitan because we needed to install software updates. Software updates wouldn't install because there was no app store, and the Apple website couldn't be accessed to download the app store in Safari because the old version of Safari doesn't support apple.com's security. So we had to download Chrome, to download the App Store, to run the updater, to run the installer, to update the operating system, and then finally, with El Capitan installed, all the server software was missing. As it turns out, after Snow Leopard server, Apple stopped producing server-specific versions of their operating systems, made the old baked-in programs stop working after the upgrade, and then they released the OS X server suite as an app in the App Store. It only cost 20 bucks, so no big deal, except that they stopped selling it in April of 2022, and we have no way to get it. We settled then on dual booting so that we can show off both the latest software and the XServes features. Apple, we're not saying you have to support your old hardware, but to intentionally make it impossible to use, that's just plain rude. MacOS server, super cool. Uh, wait. Okay, so sorry, is this the page? Oh, yeah. very cool. Right out of the box then, the web server is running and we just have to go to the IP address of the server that brings us to a portal for various web services that are available. Then on the dock, we've got the default server applications that set this apart from the regular Snow Leopard that would have come on your late 2009 MacBook. Server preferences allows you to change basic settings for users and groups, file sharing, which functions the way you would assume a file sharing server would, mail and iCal, which would allow it to theoretically function as a replacement for Microsoft Exchange, iChat, the familiar chat client from the era, though this time hosted for use within work groups, which allowed organizations to maintain their own chat logs in-house, and they could federate with XMPP servers to allow for chat between members in different organizations. It's got web, which handled the web server, with the UI making it super easy to implement simple intranet pages, VPN, which allowed users to connect using layer two or point-to-point -point tunneling, time machine, which has the server function as a storage place for other Macs in the network to dump their time machine backups, and security, which is pretty much just firewall rules. There are also some icons to see general information, text logs, and system usage graphs. All of this stuff looks very Apple so far, right? In a, yeah, it works, but it can't be customized much kind of way. And if that's how you want to manage your server, it's kind of a great product because that's how it'll function for you. But right beside server preferences here is the server admin button. And this is the real powerhouse. This window gives access to much more minute details and some other functions that were hidden from view in preferences for some reason. Puzzlingly, this is the only way to access things like SMB for acting as a PC compatible file server, QuickTime streaming, and podcast producer. Podcast producer was a pretty cool idea that allowed networked users to easily record video podcasts following workflows that were created beforehand in Podcast Composer. 
Two cameras could be connected to the server and then could be recorded from at once with the recording process controlled using the web portal or the podcast capture application on Mac. Once the recording was complete, it would automatically be encoded and could even be published automatically if that's what the workflow called for. If there were multiple servers in the network configured through XGrid, CPU heavy tasks like encoding could be offloaded to those servers. This was probably a pretty great system to record things like university lectures without requiring too much human intervention or tying up all the compute power from a single server. Moving on, there's Workgroup Manager, which is exactly what it sounds like. Podcast Composer, which allowed management of things like the workflows used in Podcast Producer. Screen Sharing, which worked like most VNC remote access tools, but was Mac specific. And System Image Utility, a super cool tool for creating customized network bootable and installable images of Snow Leopard. This could be used to deploy standardized installs to a lot of computers at once, or to have networked computers boot right off of the image on the server. Considering that this breadth of features came baked into a server OS that had an easy to use GUI with no cost added on top of the hardware, it's a little surprising that the product wasn't popular enough to survive, especially when you account for Windows Server's absolutely ridiculous pricing structure. I mean, not only does Windows Server cost more than desktop Windows, the client access licenses, or CALs, mean that you have to pay an additional license fee for every user who is going to access that server. Or, come to think of it, maybe that's what makes all of this not surprising at all. Like any corporation, Apple's raison d'etre is to make money. And being a forward-looking company, Apple would have clearly recognized that the world was moving to cloud-based storage and services rather than locally hosted ones. So, with that in mind, are they better off trying to bitterly compete and increase their one-time licensing costs for these bare metal servers? Or are they better off charging users monthly to build up their own centralized infrastructure and subscription-based revenue? Well, I think we all know the answer to that. But that doesn't mean the XServe is totally dead. There's an active enthusiast community that is dedicated to keeping these machines in service, turning them into personal servers, budget Mac Pro replacements, or whatever Frankenstein monstrosities their little Mac-loving minds can come up with. LTT and Frankenstein monstrosities actually go hand in hand. And what better way to monstrify something than to turn it into a formidable gaming machine? Now, unfortunately, we ran into some challenges getting that going for today, not the least of which was that we wanted to upgrade the CPUs for better performance, and it turns out Apple uses delidded Xeons? Like, what? Are they the, the play it safe fruit company, or are they a bunch of mad scientist enthusiasts? I can never tell. Anyway, let me know in the comments if you want to see a follow-up. I think that would be a lot of fun. Fun, like this segue to our sponsor. Micro Center, where it's Monitor Madness Month. I mean, what good is having an amazing computer if you don't have a monitor to go with it? You can get great deals on monitors all month long and complete your dream gaming setup. One of our favorites is this 170 hertz, 27 inch QHD ASUS gaming monitor that you can grab today using the link in the video description. And the good deals aren't limited to just monitors either. Laptops, computer components, peripherals, TVs, networking equipment, you name it, they've got it. They even have an in-house PC building team that can put together a new custom rig that is as unique as as you are. With 25 stores across the US, an Indianapolis store coming this summer, and more on the way, they make it easier than ever to find what you're looking for. And if you're having any technical difficulties, they've got your back with their certified technicians at the Knowledge Bar. So head over to the description box and check them out using the link down below. If you enjoyed this video, you might also enjoy Anthony's guide to turning your old PC into a home server.